excuse, get shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, you're gonna have fun on this show. I got I got a lot to <laughs> say to you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you're you're old school. All right, here we go. This and this. Okay, zombie. When do you want to go? Go ahead. You tell me when. I oh, started. I, I already started. Are you recording? <laughs> Attention bar patrons, happy hour has begun. Drinks are our half price and it's time to loosen up from your work week. Show some love to your bartender, that lovable loudmouth with absolutely no filter, Trevor Garner. What do you know about this world? What are your future plans? Get off your throne. Get off your throne. And have a little faith in All right, let's have a faith in and, and, uh, Trevor's Happy Hour on Sunday night. I finally have got Warren Brewster on my show. I, I've, been, I've been wondering about you for a while, dude. <laughs> yeah. All right. You, you, <laughs> zombie, zombies on the phone. Zombie, say hi to Warren. What's a phone? <laughs> hi, Warren. <laughs> zombies from the old school. He had rotary dial too. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I don't, I don't know if my picture's up. But anyways, hey, Warren. Now, here's the thing. I want to, I like, uh, explain who you are. You, All right. You are, a, well, this is just in my opinion. You're, you're a baseball player from Major League Baseball that you came up, what, 1976 or so? Somewhere around 77. there? 77. 77. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you were a stud. I mean, most people don't realize who Warren Brewster was. I mean, this dude, right. it's like he had like a low ERA. He, I mean, he didn't give up any runs. I mean, how did that happen? I mean, you were just good. <laughs> yeah. Right. I had two very good years, my first two years, and then I hurt my shoulder. Yeah, see, that's that's the thing. But see, Zombie, see, Warren Warren didn't give up any runs. I mean, he was like he was like the the bonus baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. the Bonus baby. <laughs> he was. He was a bonus baby of baseball. Uh, well, that's what I'll call him. You know, a little stick. But hey, Ward. So baby, when you came up, like through the minor league system, how did you get involved in baseball? When where'd you come from, Warren? Where'd you come from as a kid? Well, I live in Napa, California, mm -hmm. and I played baseball. I played basketball, baseball, football all through school, all through high school. Mm -hmm. And then by the time I graduated from high school, it was time to pick a sport. My football and basketball careers had pretty much <laughs> ended because I couldn't run a lick. So that kind of eliminated me from that. But uh, I had a good arm. And my senior year in high school, I did very well. And then it was, um, I got to, I was trying to find a place to continue. I wasn't ready to sign because I had no clue what I was doing. So I started asking the scouts um, all around the area who were the best pitching coach or who knew the most about pitching in Northern California. And they all told me Bob Bennett at Fresno State was an outstanding pitching coach. So I got on the phone and called him up, told him who I was. And he said, let me get back to you. And he, uh, a couple days later, called me back, said, come down and look at the school. And I want to talk for me. So I threw for him on the side and uh, he gave me a scholarship. So I went there and spent two years under his tutelage and learned how to pitch uh, from him and then just went out in the minor league and applied it every fifth day. Okay, but so 1976, 77, let's get around to that era. How much did they sign you for? Like, what, uh, 50 cents? Mm. No, I actually got a decent bonus. I got $8,000 and then uh, $7,500 incentive. Okay. 
But I've got a thousand double A, uh, fifteen hundred for triple A, and five thousand if you played in the big leagues for ninety days. Wow, well, I'll still that's not much, but not to today's. No, no. But, Which, but it's, I, it's, it, my thinking always was if I got to the big leagues, I'd make money. Yeah, you would. I mean, but you, I mean, yeah. you're really good. I mean, I, I mean, every time I now here's the other thing, Warren. Every time I opened up a pack of baseball cards. There's another Warren Brewster card. And I go, oh, my gosh, I keep getting Warren Brewster cards. What am I going to do with all these things? Right. <laughs> and, and you got paid $5 to be on top right. of it. That's right. <laughs> the days were different back then. I mean, how do you feel about the way it was back in those days compared to today? You happy? Well, I, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I thought the money I made was ridiculous, you know, and and now it's just, it's utterly ridiculous. You know, it's just, I love playing the game. I, the money from, to me didn't mean that much. It wasn't that important. You know, it was how important you were to the organization as far as how much they were going to pay you, stuff like that. But for me, I enjoyed going out and competing. I got a chance to play against the best players in the world, you know, and I, I couldn't wait to get to the ballpark every day and get ready to play. You know, and that's the one thing I enjoyed. Uh, is a part of uh, pitching was uh, being a reliever because I came to the ballpark with a chance to play every day. So right. you had that, that certain mindset. You go about your work, get ready for uh, the game every time. And, well, I mean, today, you know what, these guys, they're always thinking money in advance before they even go play. Right. You're a coach. Yes, I coach at Napa Valley College. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I've been doing that on and off for 20 years. So, okay, let's get back to 1977, okay? When you came up, right. how, how how did you, uh, well, what, what, what was it about you that, like, set you apart? I mean, you were, a, were you like a reliever or a middle reliever? I was a middle reliever. My job was to come in and get ground balls. I used to do a sinking fastball. I had an outstanding movement on my fastball. And my job was to come in uh, when I first got to Philadelphia from anywhere from the first to the seventh inning with runners on base. And if it was uh, close to the pitcher's position hitting in the order, they would bring me in. A lot of times I'd come in, throw two or three pitches, get out of that inning, and they'd pinch hit for me the next inning. How many times, so, did, you, how many times did you save Steve Carlton's game? Oh, never. The what? You never, never. said Steve the, Carlton? The, the only time I came, the only time I can remember coming into a game was when we were in Pittsburgh in 1978, and we needed to win one game, and it was the second game of a doubleheader on Friday night, and he loaded the bases and uh, with no outs, and, and I was up throwing, so Danny Ozark brought me in to uh, see if he could get three ground balls to get out of the inning and uh, get some ground balls and, and like, get him out of the inning. <laughs> and I blocked the run in before he, I even threw, I threw one pitch to Jim Fergosi and I blocked before. I, Dave Parker was jumping around at third base and I blocked. So we lost the game anyway. You know, but as far as saving games for Steve Carlton, that wasn't my job. Okay, so Steve, we had Ron, Steve we, Carlton completed Ron his own games. He completed his own right. game. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, you, I mean, yeah, like, I, I, Ron, Reed, Ron, Reed, Garber, yeah, yeah. The, I'm, a, I'm a base, I'm a, I'm a base, I'm a baseball kid. I mean, I'm a baseball fanatic. I mean, you probably saved Larry Christensen. I mean, we know this, uh, like guys like this. I mean, but, but see you, you, how do I put this? You were such a good pitcher, but nobody ever gave you any credibility. Right. Right. Yeah. I know. Yeah, I mean that was that was my job was the middle innings, and it doesn't, you know, it's you don't realize uh, until it's all said and done. You realize, whoa, he held it in that fourth, fifth, sixth inning, whenever, and, and then we came back and scored three or four runs and came back and won. Yeah, we won. I got a lot of wins that way. Where I come into a ball game, get a couple of outs, pitch an inning, the third or inning, and two thirds, and, and all of a sudden we'd score because we were a very offensive ball club. Mm-hmm. So they'd score two or three runs and take the lead, and then uh, Ron Reed, Tug, or or uh, Gene Garber 
close out the game and we'd end up winning ball games. Yeah, how, just, how, how many times yeah, did, was, how many how many times did you beat the Dodgers? Very seldom. <laughs> they they were better they had better pitching than we did. See that was the yeah, time thought, when the Phillies and the Dodgers were the head to head for going to the playoffs in the World Series. And right. And uh you were part of that whole world about the Luzinski and Schmidt and all that. You were like right in the mix. I mean, what what did you guys think? I mean, it was like you could never get past them. Well, we had them beat the one. We split the two games in L.A. and then we came home and played game three in and and uh, there was a ball. There were two outs in the top of the ninth, and we had a one run lead. And the ball hit one of the on uh, uh, astroturf, one of the lips on the astroturf, and bounced off Schmidt's chest. And Larry Boa came across and barehanded it and threw. Um, Davy Lopes out at first, mm-hmm. and Bruce Summing, the umpire, called him safe. And you know, and we, you look at the replays, and he, he was out by half a step. Had we had replay in those days, we would have won that game because the game was over. I mean, the fans were already jumping out out on the field because the game was over. We won the game, but he called him safe instead of calling him out. And then the um, uh, pickoff throw was thrown away, and the next hitter, Bill Russell, hit a ball between Dean Garber's legs up the middle, and that. Scored the winning run, and we ended up losing the bargain. Yeah, truth, truth. I, was there. I mean, I'm a Dodger well, fan. Back in, back in those days, I was a Dodger fan. But, I I mean, I really think that you guys were – you might have been better. <laughs> I don't know. You were pretty good. Your your teams were good right. in the 70s. Yeah. Right. right. But the pitching, when it comes down to playoff series, the pitching is what dominates. And the Dodger pitching was tough to beat. Right. Zombie, you there? What's that? Oh, zombie. Yeah. Zombie, you remember the 78, 77 Dodgers? Steve Howe? Steve Howe was like 81. Yeah. Oh, well, 70, <laughs> 77. <laughs> we're, talking, we're talking about, well, see, see, zombie's my sidekick. Say hi to Warren. Hi, Warren. <laughs> I barely, I barely remember 78. Give me a break. <laughs> Tommy, Tommy was in the military in 1977 smoking weed. But, okay. <laughs> anyway, but let's, get, let's get back to this. Keeping the so country Tommy, safe. He was keeping our country <laughs> safe. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Here's a, <laughs> well, that's another funny story. Like, when they had, like, disco demolition and all this. I mean, you see, Warren was, like, look at his big hair. Warren had the giant hair. Yep. Right. <laughs> look like, looked like you enjoyed shoe as well. Did you? Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you did you? Yeah. yeah I was just, uh, yeah, the seventies uh, were something else. But I mean I, I was look, I was too young, but see Zombie graduated in nineteen seventy four. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, actually I, I was a giant. Darn Cub fan. That was the, that was the best. Cub fan. Oh, the Cubs of Phillies. Yeah. Yeah, Cubs and Phillies. There you go. That was Poor old Cubs. <laughs> no, back then the Cubs were horrible. But see, Warren, uh, Warren, Warren, who was your biggest nemesis when you, when, you, when you played? Who was your biggest nemesis? Oh, as far as hitter, I had a hard time getting out. Yeah, yeah. Keith Hernandez. I couldn't get Keith Hernandez out to save my life. And we played against each other since we were little kids. He grew up here in the Bay Area also. Uh-huh. And we used to play. Uh, they used to have a, when I got drafted by the Giants, they used to go down on Saturdays and pitch for them at Orange Park down in South, South San Francisco. And they had a league there. The Cardinals had a team. The Twins had a team. The Mets had a team. So we played a different different team every weekend for two games, like one on Saturday, one on Sunday. And Keith played for the Cardinals because his father was a Cardinal scout in those years. So we played against each other since we were in high school, and I was in junior college at the time. Mm-hmm. So I teased for years, and I have never gotten him out yet. Right? You, you, are you happy that uh, Ted Simmons is in the Hall of Fame? Yes. Yeah, yes, without question. He is a great player. Yes. How, we have, well, I'm going to ask you these questions, because I mean, cause you'll understand. You were around there. Who, who should be in the Hall of Fame that's not? 
Well, they keep Hernandez. They mentioned him now a little bit. Uh, he's one guy. You know, there are, there are quite a few people that should be that have that deserve to be in the Hall of Fame if you go by their numbers. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's it's uh, to me, it's hard when the press you know holds stuff against players. You know, like certain team, certain media will not vote for players off certain teams and stuff like that, where it's you know, it should be voted on by merit. You know, and fortunately now we finally have somebody that's gotten all 100% of the vote because like Willie Mays, Mickey Mantle, all, Ted Williams, all these guys, how can they not have not gotten yeah, 100% of the vote? Given. And that's all a given. Yeah. But I mean, there are players right. behind the scenes, you know, like, I mean, I'll, I'll throw some names out. I say Jim Cott, I say Tommy John. I mean, these right. are names that how in the heck they're not in the Hall of Fame? And well, I mean, Kirby Puckett's in. Okay, I understand. You know, yeah, yeah. I kind of go. Well, wait a minute. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. The longevity of those guys like Tommy John and Tim Scott. You know that that's something when you play that long. You know, and that was I played with Jim for two years in Philadelphia. Right, and he just continued to reinvent himself. From day to day, in fact, I'll tell you a quick story. I, uh, I told you I hurt my arm. I had a bad shoulder, and I'd lost velocity on my fastball, so I had to come up with another pitch. So I learned a changeup. So I started throwing changeups. So we were playing St. Louis. We were in St. Louis, and I see Kitty before the game, and I'm, I, we're talking about it. And I go, Kitty, you won't believe this, but I learned this circle change. You know, so I, I show him how I throw, and I've been throwing it all the time, and really been affected for me that it makes my fastball that much better so he, he comes into the game that night and throws ron same one I mean, he just he was unbelievable the things that he could do you know he just he reinvented himself and uh, knew how to pitch uh quick pitch guys never let the guys get comfortable in the box um you know so you know and there's something to say about guys like that tommy john you know, had a great sinker and just would get ground ball after ground ball after ground ball. You know, and the longevity of those guys to do that is, you know, merits something. Is is there a middle reliever in the Hall of Fame? Oh, I wouldn't think so. No, no. I mean, it's hard enough. There's not too many closers well, that are in the Hall Mariano, of Fame. Mariano Rivera, you know, but, uh, but I mean, like a middle, yeah, but a middle reliever. I mean, right. you know, like Edgar Martinez got in as a DH, right? So right. maybe there should be a middle reliever in the Hall of Fame. That should be you. Okay, the way the relief, the way the relieving is going now. Yeah, it's kind of, uh, they don't really have a lot of stats for, for middle relief. There's, well, they got the hold now, so that's that's something. So there, there are some kind of stats for that. But, I mean, it's it's very difficult when you see how few, like, third basemen are in the Hall of Fame, how many how few catchers are in the Hall of Fame, how few relief catchers are in the Hall of Fame. Uh, it's it's um, something that, you know, needs to be looked at. And I think as time goes on with uh, the Veterans Committee and it's getting more baseball-oriented people involved with, uh, the Hall of Fame, I think that'll change in time. Are you a baseball player or a baseball fan? Oh, I'm I, a baseball fan. I see, I mean, like fan. Even, even before you were a player, you were a fan. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I you, was, you, was, you collected. My, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I collected baseball cards. Yeah, I still have them today. Uh, my father would pick me up from school. My father was a commercial artist. Mm-hmm. So he worked pretty much his own hours. And he would pick me up from school in the afternoon, not in elementary school. We'd come home and listen to the giant game during the day because they played a lot of day games. And then when uh, when it got dark at night, we could pick up the L.A. station and we would listen to the Dodgers. I would come out to a studio and I'd sit there and listen to the Dodgers play at night. Yeah, so I've always, you know, and that was uh, when I first got released, I came home to see my parents for, and spend some time with them. And the first thing my dad did was get a transistor radio and hand it to me and say, here, let's listen to the game. Your dad must have been really proud when you like got in the major leagues. He goes, what the heck did I produce? 
Yes, right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we would. I would come home uh, in January, spend some time before I go to spring training. I would spend uh, a few weeks with my parents before I go to spring training. And my dad would get, get the gloves out and say, oh, spring training's right around the corner. you got about three or four weeks left. Come on, get the gloves. Let's go play catch. And we'd go out in the yard and play catch every year. Yeah, he was my biggest supporter. He was, he was, uh, I was very lucky. He was behind me 100%. I, I always like talking to baseball players. I mean, it's like you guys are always like so honest. And yeah, I mean, I mean, as much as they they make all this money today, I don't think they want to be the way they are. I mean, they just want to be normal people. But right. Right. They can't, they can't be now. I mean, it's with all the millions of dollars, they just shut them up. You know. It's, right. It's, it's terrible. Yeah. yeah. Whole different world. Yeah, you have to be very private and. And really watch your step today, and, and be aware of you know what what you're doing out there, and, and trying, especially now with the pandemic, they're they're really enclosed now. They've got to really be careful. What would you do? What would you tell a kid today, like that wants to become a major league player? Well, um, a kid named Tyler Craig, he got to the big leagues with Milwaukee. Uh, spent. Uh, he probably got about a year and a half of time in, mm-hmm. um, and it's just just do what you can do. You know, put your nose to the grindstone and work hard at it. Whatever you know, and that was what my father taught me. He said, if you want to do something bad enough, you'll figure out how to do it. You know, so that's what I did, and I tried to exhaust every option I had as far as uh, baseball was concerned because I loved to play the game. I loved, I enjoyed the competition and and competing with somebody or competing with people. And that's what I tell kids. That's what I would tell them is if you love it bad enough, you know, especially, and I'm from the old school of you should try to get a college education because if you're 21, 22 years old and you go out and try to play in the minor leagues, you probably learned how to take care of yourself. That was the biggest thing for me was uh, going to Fresno state and learning how to, uh, make food for myself and prepare, you know, a daily plan of going to school, getting something to eat, working out, going to practice, you know, preparing to play, all that, you know, and, and that's not easy for an 18, 19 year old kid to do. Uh, so I, that's what I always try to tell kids is uh, try to get an education, get as far as you can in school. And then that's something that you've always got. If you can get a four year education and get your degree, then you've always that nobody can take take away from you. Baseball is not going to last forever. Now I want to ask you another question. What about baseball players and chasing women? <laughs> I'm not the first to ask about that. Well, yeah, that's, you know what? Like yeah. Billy, Sample, Billy Sample came on my show, and he he did that reunion one away, but but he, he like did this thing about all these guys are like you know in the uh, at the hotel, and I look, I remember because I used to go to Anaheim Stadium, and across the street was like National Sports Bar, and all these bar, all these like bar fly baseball players would come in after the game, and they'd be chasing women all over the place. Well, I'm just asking you what your opinion is of all this. I mean, what what did you see? Well, it was it was crazy. I mean, it was back when, yeah, uh, it was before AIDS. Yeah, so that way. Uh-huh. So it wasn't as bad as you know. It was wasn't as dangerous as it is today. You didn't have to be as careful. Yeah, we'll, we'll go back to your we'll go back to your era. But go ahead, uh, tell me. I mean, were you yeah. guys really that? Were you really that? Uh, Go ahead, just tell me. I want to. I want to know what it was like. Well, it was a lot of fun. You know, I enjoyed going out and having a car after the game. That was, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I went out just about every night because I believed in doing the same thing. You know, and that's what they always say about this place or how it. Zombie, zombies not talking, but then you got married. Yes. Mm-hmm. And. And your wife is in charge of the Tug, Tug McGrock Foundation. I mean, that's... Yeah, I did. I met her after I retired. Yeah, yeah, but see, that's that's pretty cool, too, because, I mean, you take care of your, you know, you take care of your players. I mean, and your wife is involved. I mean, that's really cool, too. Tell, tell me about that. How'd that happen? 
Well, we were in spring training. I was coaching in the minor leagues. And Tug came down as a special instructor. And we were about two weeks into spring training, and all of a sudden, Tug collapsed. And they didn't know what to do with him. They took him to the hospital, and they realized he had a brain tumor. So now what? So my wife was a flight attendant at the time, and she was looking for something to transition from being a flight attendant. Uh And so she immediately got on the plane and came to Clearwater, Florida, where we were in spring training. And we got a hold of Tim and Faith Hill, just happened to be right there in the area. They were uh, they were in Orlando uh, doing a gig in Orlando, so they just happened to be in the area. So they came over, and so we kind of sat down, and the girls sat down and tried to find out what you know what the options were and where to go. So my wife Jennifer kind of took on as his caregiver so tug couldn't travel so he stayed uh they finally had a uh operation in at uc or at um usf at university of south florida in tampa uh-huh. and his brother and they rented a apartment or a house over in tampa so i used to and i was coaching in the minor leagues so i'd have weekends off so i'd go over and see him on the weekends And then he wanted to go back to Philly and move back to Philly. So Tim McGraw gave gave a use of one of his buses, and they loaded everything up from Tampa, and they all moved up to Philadelphia, back up to media. And so my wife and my youngest son, Jack, took care of of Tug for, oh, about three months until Jack had to go back to school, and then... By that time, I was done coaching in my place, so I was back home. So Jennifer went back to Philly and took care of Tug and uh, learned all about the blastoma and all the stuff, all the cancer, all that stuff, and really got into it. So they sat down together, and he wanted to put together a foundation. So between him and her and, and they started working on it. And then when he passed away, he started really getting into the foundation. Can you tell me? Yeah. Can you tell me like, can you tell me a little bit about the foundation? Like, I mean, what it's about? Well, she is, her office is at the veterans home up in Yonville. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe in the, I know it's the biggest one in California it houses over a thousand veterans and she has an office there and, and she does she has um, on one part of the campus she has what's called a brain garden she has um, Home Depot comes in every year and refinishes does they, this year they worked or two years ago they couldn't come this year Two years ago, they worked on all, uh, they redid like six um, of the six of the, um, where they eat, all the inside the kitchens, all that stuff. Uh, and uh, they built her these big planter boxes that she has gardened. So now the vets that are there, if they want to garden, they can have their own little box to garden in. Uh, so that's, she tries to keep them involved. They have uh, a softball team called Nuts, Mixed Nuts. Uh, so they play every, they have 10 Mondays, uh, starts so about the middle of April to uh, the 1st of July. They get to play, use the baseball field there at Yonville. It's called Borman Field. It's one of the nicest parks. It's a beautiful ballpark. It's been there since so i think they built it in the 1920s i played legion ball there Mm -hmm. uh they play the joe dimaggio state tournament there they play american legion tournament state tournament there so it's it's a really nice ballpark right in the middle of the wine country right in the middle of um, a bunch of uh great vineyards and all that i mean it's just it's a phenomenal uh venue so there's all sorts of things going on there and she's really helped keep the veterans going and, and giving them something to do. Uh, when we play, when the Nets play, they have, we have uh, one guy that comes out and hits, he's in a wheelchair. 
they have uh, another guy that plays. Oh, that's cool. He's ninety four years old, so it's there's all sorts of it's. They all have a great time, and that's why so baseball they get, players. That's why baseball players are great. I mean, we all get to be old and fat, and we're in like wheelchairs, and uh, you know what? I mean, but the thing is, you know what? You look at baseball players; they're still baseball players. Like Jackie Robinson died at 53 years old of like, you know, diabetes, but you know what? He was a baseball player. And, and, and look, mm-hmm. Morgan Hershiser is my, one of my heroes because he was a nice guy. And I mean, right. I, I look, I look at baseball players as normal people, but when they got all the money, it screwed up. I don't, I don't want, yeah, right. I don't want, I don't want them having any money. Let's take the money back. <laughs> 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 Good, because you're talking to the right guy, then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll take all the money back from these guys. Yeah. Right. Well, that was that was Tug's. That's one of Tug's famous lines. I, I um, spent ninety percent of uh, spent ninety percent of my money on wine, women, and song, and I and I wasted the other ten percent. <laughs> <laughs> well, like Babe Ruth said, I got a hundred thousand dollars. I had a better year than him in the president. You know what? Right. It's, <laughs> yeah, that's why I made more money than the president. Right. Yeah, yeah. Zombie there. Yeah. I just, I want to watch a game today, but, you know, I, I try and watch. And the piped in music and the cardboard people in the stands just, it drives me. Just, I can't watch it. Anyway, I can listen to it like on the radio, like pretending it's a radio. But when I sit there and watch it, it just, it just breaks my heart. It just makes it feel so strange. I'll tell so you this. Fake. Hey, I'm it's gonna ask so before fake. before Warren like responds. Roy Firestone said, "Without the fans, baseball isn't baseball." What do you think? I, you, if you're asking me, he's totally right. Yeah, I mean that's. Well, but see, Mark Latell, Mark Latell, he told me, "No, we're just. I'm just trying to get the guy out. He don't care about the fans." But I mean, I'm just wondering how you felt when you're on the mound. I mean, did the fans influence you at all? I can remember, you know, only one time, and that was in Dodger Stadium. I can, re- and to this day, when I hear, dun, 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 they, 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 it was like the seventh, eighth inning of a game. I came in behind Steve Carlton. He went out with a shoulder problem. Mm-hmm. And we had like a three or four run lead. And I was cruising. I pitched three innings. Now it gets to like the eighth inning, and I started running out of gas. And I can remember where. Yeah, like Mark Littell said, when I was pitching, I didn't know if there were 50,000 people there or nobody. I did. I was so intent on playing catch with the catcher that I didn't pay any attention to that. But this is one time where it started before they started before I got ready to pitch. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like I got the ball back from third and they started, da, 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 and I got on the mound and went, whoa. And I actually, I, I actually did. I let it bother me. I, 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 it broke my concentration. Wow. Where I started listening to that and paying attention to what I was doing. And, uh, I don't know if I got an out in that inning. I know I gave up four or five hits in a row and that was the end of that. And we ended up losing the ball game. And I, it was the, the only time I can ever remember where I let something influence me other than what was going on as, as far as, uh, facing the hitter or, or that. I don't. I don't see them putting cardboard people in the stands and piping the music as for the for the players because they're still announcing them. They're still giving them the walk on, and like, why? I got three announcers that are telling me they're all calling the game for me, and I know nobody's out there. Why are you doing that? Just let me watch the game. Tell me about the game, you know. And when they watch the game, don't send all this other fake crap over to me. It, it just, yeah. I love it, but I, I love my game. But I... all right, well, but that's see, that's the zombie. That's the thing that Warren Warren grew up in the seventies, and that's where he like uh, he cut his chops. And uh, I still say, like back when I in the seventies, his baseball card was worthless. I mean, Warren, <laughs> your baseball card wasn't worth anything. And I just I, like two cents. I, I kept getting them, and I couldn't get rid of them. <laughs> Well, I tell but. people, I tell people, I have one card that's valuable. Yeah. Uh, when I was with Cubs, 
um, there's a picture of me in my stretch position. It's uh, well, I'm on the mound and Ryan Sandberg's in the background. Mm-hmm. So I've got one card that's valuable. Hey, wait, were you part of the Sandberg game? Wait, wait, were you in the Sandberg game? No. Oh, yeah, I was. Yeah, I did. Yeah. You were part of the game. I was hurt, but yeah, the Sandberg game. Yeah, I came in. I struck out Art House. I just saw that in the last couple months. Oh, really? So I mean, you were at the Sandberg game. Oh, Right, man. And eighty-five Cubs were my favorite team. Yeah, they were great. Oh my! You know what? They don't hit me. Your car is just going for ninety-nine cents. (laughs) Ninety-nine. But but another one. It's going for fifteen dollars. So I don't know how that works. But. No, but see, Warren, you were really in the Sandberg game where, like, uh, he kept hitting those home runs. Yeah. Right. Right. All right. Yeah. 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 His Rhino was something else. He was a great player. I played against. I was with him uh, in nineteen eighty one. I got sent back to AAA, and uh-huh. uh, he was our shortstop. And so that, go ahead. He was. You know, just it was like whatever he did, he made no effort at all. Everything was so smooth. It was just like hitting, running. I mean, it just it was amazing how fast he was. For you know, he was a pretty good sized kid, and he just did everything so smooth. I mean, he was just what a phenomenal athlete. Yeah, and at least Smith should be. I'm I'm glad he's in the hall. Right, right. Ron yeah, I I didn't understand that because he led the. Well, he was at one point the. Sage leader uh, all time, and he was yeah. When he came to his softball game, game was over. And then uh, Dallas had the idea because we played so many day games in Chicago to back up the games, and we played some three oh five starts as summertime went on. And it would get about six thirty seven o'clock, and the sun's starting to go down, and it'd come across the field in the shadows, and Lee Smith had come into the game, and you couldn't even see the ball. Yeah, I mean, it was just, it was phenomenal. What a, what a great arm he had. What a great player. And uh, what a great career he had. I know, but what a great honor to like, to, to like play in that era. And people don't realize Dale Murphy, the Atlanta Braves. I mean, they don't realize what it was like. The Padres. The pot. Well, Tony Gwynn. Yeah, of course. Right. But I mean, I mean, you guys were like, Makes me want, it makes me sad. I mean, the people don't understand who you were, and now all they think about is Mike Trout and blah 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 blah. But you know what I mean? I mean, you guys were great. Yeah, I was very fortunate. I I was on great teams. You know, I I played nine years and I was in the playoffs five times out of the nine years I played. Wow, wow, that is fortunate. But you didn't give up any runs. No, I was, that was, I was, got stronger as the year went on. Mm-hmm. And so I always look forward to playoff time because that's when I was pitching my best. So what are, what are your, like, goals and aspirations going forward? Well, I, my goals, uh, you know, I, are to get the kids I had, coach at the college mm-hmm. on the four-year school. And we send, we, we place just about every kid that we have. Because the four-year colleges somewhere in the country love California junior college baseball players. Where, where, where is this school? Where is the school? I'm in Napa, in Napa Valley. I'm about 60 miles uh, northeast of San Francisco uh-huh. in the wine country. Yeah, I get it. Okay. Keep going. Well, so, you're a wine country up in Napa Valley. And, but see, Warren yeah. Brewster is like... He's like going to raise all these kids on wine and drinks and stuff. I mean, that's what he's doing. We know. No, I have a Christmas tree farm. <laughs> I have the only Christmas tree farm left in Napa. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know what I want to say to you? Uh, this guy is kind of a like, kind of a funny show, but I want to say you and Mike Lacoste. Yeah, you guys are like up there. Yeah, Buffy's a friend of mine. <laughs> yeah, I've known Buffy for oh fifty years. Yeah, he yeah. He was from the valley. He grew up in Visalia when I was at Fresno State. He was in Visalia. Yeah, yeah. Okay, keep going. I like this. It's like, I mean, you guys are up in the in North Cal, but I'm I'm Southern California. I'm in Anaheim, so I'm glad I beat you in 2002. <laughs> yeah, I lived in Long Beach one winter. 
I went I went to all the, right the I, went, I went to all the World Series games and I was like I you know who was standing behind me was Buddy Bell and got, uh, David Bell oh, really? David Bell was like the third baseman for the Giants and I looked right. at him and I go and I go and I was standing with, with the last out when Percival pitched it and like Erstack caught it and I looked at Buddy Bell and I go ha ha <laughs> I go, I'm sorry you <laughs> lost, but you know what? The Angels deserve it after all this time. And they finally right. got the World Series. So, uh, like, uh, yeah, for the, Pretty for Keaton. Not... Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Buddy, Buddy Bell and I were, like, standing together. Okay. Uh, that's, that's just, like, some, like, weird information. But go ahead. <laughs> 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 but, see, that's the thing, too. Like, like baseball players, you can walk around in the stadium and there could be a baseball player in like incognito and they they go i don't want to be noticed and then like I, there i had a few of them before and i go i know who you are and they go well don't say anything i don't want to give my autograph <laughs> yeah <laughs> what <laughs> i i'll tell you a quick story about i was at candlestick park way back in oh geez it was I started coaching in 1990 at Napa Valley College, and the head coach and I, uh, I still had some play, our teammates that were playing, Craig Lefferts was playing with the Padres at the time, mm-hmm. and um, the head coach that I was with, Matt Stewart, he knew um, oh, I was a left-handed reliever out of Chico. So we were going to go down and go to the game and say hi to him after the game and whatever. You know, I was just going to reminisce and, and say hi to a few people. Uh, so we get there early. Let's go to batting practice. So we get there at 1130, and there's, oh, maybe 50 people in the ballpark, if that. Yeah. And so you know, I get a beer and a hot dog, and we're sitting down in our seats. And this little kid comes up and taps me on the shoulder and goes, Mr. Brewster, can I have your autograph on my baseball cards? I said, what? He goes, yeah, can I, will you sign me, these cards for me? I go, how in the world did you know this was me? I don't look anything like my cards. <laughs> yeah, and he knew it was, I don't know how in the world he knew it was me, but I signed all his cards for him. Yeah, and I mean, how many cards are you carrying around, kid? I mean, I'm going to carry my Warren Brewster cards around just in case I see him. Come on now. That's I mean, right. that's, that's, to me, that was phenomenal. I just, it absolutely blew me away. Well, I mean, yeah, that's, that's true. I mean, people like kids and stuff, they, they know, they just, they just know who you are for some reason. Maybe it's, maybe it's their parents. Maybe it's zombie. He has like zombie, (laughs) zombie, zombie gets mad because he has to do my show, Warren. And Uh uh, he goes, I just gave me 20 minutes notice. Well, you know what? I had my first cup of coffee yet. Your first, (laughs) that's the other thing, Warren, Warren. Warren, zombies old, and we're all old now. I mean, that's right. the other problem. I mean, yeah, I got my first cup of coffee. I mean, I look, if I don't lay this stuff down with Warren, how am I going to get it? What? <laughs> Did you understand that? Yeah, we got to lay down the information. Okay. <laughs> about his autograph. We got to talk about his autograph. Warren, so where are we going to go next? Well, you tell me. <laughs> Anywhere you want to go. It's fine with me. <laughs> I don't know either. Zombie's just mad. Because he, I mean, look, he was in the military. And, and, you know, he smoked a lot of weed to get out of the military. But I uh-huh. I, I understand. I mean, but see, how many, <laughs> why do I want to talk about people that were on drugs and baseball? But the, the other thing, too, is, like, Warren, when what was your biggest high that you got in baseball? What was the biggest high that you got? Well, winning the World Series without question. Eighty, you know, that, Nin- yeah, nineteen eighty, yeah, right, right. Because we'd gotten so close in seventy seven and seventy eight, and they, you know, this was the fourth year out of five that they got into the playoffs, and we finally got past the at least got to the World Series, and it was. Uh, it, it was like the pressure was off. Finally, we got there. We finally got past the Dodgers, and we didn't have to worry about the Dodgers. And uh, 
we had a knockdown drag out series with Houston for five games, and uh, now I was relaxed and just have fun and with it and get into the World Series. You know, I, I didn't even want to go to this question, but you're going to say Pete Rose belongs in the Hall of Fame. Yes, without question. For, See, you know, I, for what I, Pete I, I never even thought player. of asking you this, but Pete Rose belongs in the Hall of Fame. Right. Well, I mean, to me, your all-time hit leader, your all-time home run leader. He gave you more the more than, he than gave you that World Series. None of those you. guys are in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, he, but he gave you that World Series. Right. Right. With his tenacity yeah. and the growth. Yeah, he was. He, yeah, he was. It was a very intense player. I love playing with him. Hated playing against him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was. He was great. I just. He was. Unbelievable how intense you, you just you couldn't explain. You have to sit in the dugout to, to see how intense he was during a game. I remember, got by I remember I remember Mike Schmidt when he was like inducted in the Hall of Fame. And Mike Schmidt said Pete Rose needs to be in the Hall of Fame. Like, I mean, that was that made me cry. I go, Wow. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's crazy the stuff he did off the field, but as far as baseball, he was nobody there was nobody better. And he was the only guy, he was two for 11 off me. He was the only guy I paid attention to uh, as far as facing him. Well, you know what else? I'll tell you one thing. Pete Rose, he's a good guy, but he's he's a character. I mean, he's a character. And, yes. uh, you know, yeah, he, he is what he is. But, I mean, leave right. him alone. Leave him alone. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Like Warren Brewster, I keep getting his baseball card on my packs. I mean, I'm tired. I'm tired of these Warren Brewster cards. <laughs> well, I think that's the show, dude. All right. Well, I'm uh, glad I got you on. I got to talk to you. And uh, oh, thank you, Trevor. Zombie, zombie, <laughs> zombie looks like Harold Lloyd with Warren Brewster in his back. <laughs> <laughs> I got to pick you up, you up you with uh, at Napa Valley coaching. In Napa Valley, we got a picture. Yes. Of, well, we got a picture of you up. Yeah, um, that's the show. Hey, Warren, what's your what's your favorite band? Oh, gee. well, I, I, you know, I love the Beatles. Um, I love Bruce Springsteen. You know, mm-hmm. I was fortunate enough. I when I lived in Philly. I could go to concerts and they'd sit me backstage right off the side of the stage. Uh, yeah, it was awesome. I loved. I'm an old rock and roller, so any kind of rock and roll. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's yeah. like uh, zombies. Like, see, Zombie Wolf. He's like he's into like Frank Zappa. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I had I took a music appreciation class at Fresno State. That was the the. Uh, Prof, the professor, that was one of his favorite guys was Frank Zappa. So we had to listen to Frank Zappa. That was part of the class. Yeah, they went from one end of the spectrum to the other. You want to you yeah. hear me out? I'm going to do an outro. Uh, this is Trevor's Happy Hour with Warren Brewster, Zombie Wolf, Sunday Night, and uh, Pete Rose belongs in the Hall of Fame. What else did we learn from this conversation? <laughs> there's, there's, there's too many Warren Brewer baseball cards in the past. And they should be worth a lot more. <laughs> they should be worth more than two cents. Yeah, relievers are the big part. Relievers are the big part of the game. Big, That's big part. Right. <laughs> That's right. You're right, zombie. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I'll, I'll so my- are girls eating hot dogs, but. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. So everybody, we're gonna play this out. Let's see what I can do here. Do 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 do. do. Okay. Good night, everybody. Hey. Hey. Good night, Warren. Thank you for coming on. Good night. Really appreciate Thanks, it. Sir. Anytime, sir. You guys All take right. care. All right. Bye. Kick up your weekend with a wild night at the bar. Barkeep Trevor Garner opens the door for you to share a few rounds with him and his friends great. every Friday night at nine. There's always a seat available for newcomers and regulars alike. During Trevor's happy hour, Warren's you just great. go where the conversation Warren's takes you. No agenda, no pressure, just exactly a friends to like. get together. The drinks are always you, good, Warren. and the conversation's always lively. 
feel free to call in and listen live every Friday night at 9. We'll see you there, Friday night at 9, for Trevor's Happy Hour. Goodbye, Zombie. You can go get blown up again by your, like, space alien. I'll go back to my room. <laughs> Bye. Screws will be by in a little while to bring me my I, hope, I, 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 I really hope you like the show. I mean, I mean, I'm trying to like, I'm trying hard. I'm yeah, trying but to you got to get me a little more notice. Trevor, we gave you an hour. And you're the one yesterday, you idiot, that said, hey, we're going to do a show Sunday night. No, and I didn't. I said, are we? <laughs> you did it. You're a liar. Yeah, we already did it. So hurry up so I can post this and take three hours to post it. Do what you got to do. You're the dirty dude. Did you like it? Did you, 